proud of it. Being, being proud of, of uh, what our ancestors did. I can only speak for uh, Dakota Plains and its people. Uh, we've always recognized the fact that we were here at time immemorial. There is no Manitoba border. There is no international border. Chief and I, we, uh, sometimes we wonder, like, why, why are we, why are we here? Why, why us, right? But uh, we've always had that, that inquisitive nature that, it's like disobedience. It was something I grew up with, with my mother. And then, because my mother got it from her grandmother, she got all, she, my grandmother was kind of like knew the, the relations, the, the um, oral histories. And um, my mother was raised by her grandmother. And then she carried it on to her children, which is us. And, and then so picking it up from my mother, from my grandmother, and then my great-grandmother, it was always in our family to, to be knowing our uh, history, knowing who we are. Geneva Smoke lives in Dakota Teepee First Nation, right next door to Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. And for her, this research is personal. Knowing our identity and being proud of it, being, being proud of of uh, what our ancestors did and sharing the good stories that to, to uh, instill in us, to, to give to us so that we're proud of our grandparents and the things that they did to be here. And, and just for us to be here, they, did a, they went through a lot of stuff for us to be here. So, and and just, just growing up with it. Our, our nation, our tribe, our grandparents, our ancestors, we've have always been here. We didn't just come up here when the Americans came, the American Sioux came when, when the wars were happening. They were relatives and, and across the border, because they made a border now, they were relatives to the, the American Sioux. And the American Sioux knew they were over here already because they're relatives and because of the migrations. Smoke keeps a blog, the Sioux Village Facebook page. When, when they pass away, the only thing they say is, never forget us, you know, never forget. And so, yeah, we're, we're never going to forget. Mm. And that's my passion, is, is, is knowing that our grandmothers had to go through really hard times for us to be here because the governments didn't want us to be here, didn't want our tribes to be here. But we, we, we're, we're still here and we're proving that we're, we've been here. And Smoke's research focuses on the story of the Dakota people who live in the area of Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. The history books tend to zero in on a group of Dakota people who fled the 1862 Dakota War in Minnesota, coming north of the 49th parallel. But the Dakota are a plains people, known to have historically occupied a swath of plains land stretching well into present-day Canada. Unlike other First Nations, the Dakota don't have treaties with Canada. In fact, in Portage La Prairie, they bought their own land in 1893. They were self-sufficient. Um, they purchased their own land, and they 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 were they were sovereign. They were successful. They worked for what they had. They they. they and then the governments didn't know how to um, address them because they're on their own land. Smoke says that's a little known fact. Not too much people are aware of it. And um, that's why I say it's new for some people. Dakota history in Canada is new for some people. For us, we grew up with it. I've, I've always known it. Craig Blacksmith knows it too. Blacksmith is CEO of Dakota Plains. He's been arguing for a better deal for the First Nation for more than a decade. On one hand, you know, Canada wants to reconcile. 
but how do you reconcile when you don't acknowledge the truth of what these what these uh, Indian reserves are? They're not nations. So when it when it comes to negotiating, we're not we're not taking the approach that the Indians do through Section 35 of the Repatriated Constitution, because that again is a separate set of rights. It's complicated what Craig is proposing and difficult to get across. When the Constitution was repatriated in 1982, Canada introduced the Charter of Rights legislation. So everybody's equal under the law and you know uh, liberty and uh, you know there, there's rights for a, for a human being. And then they have Section 35, which is Aboriginal rights. So this is again something that we're trying to. It's difficult to get across. Like, why do you have a different set of rights than me? And people are led to believe that somehow these Aboriginal rights or Indigenous rights are uh, kind of superior, but they're not. You may or may not agree with Craig's opinion on Section 35 of the Constitution, but the notion that Dakota people in the area around Portage La Prairie have been treated unfairly is more difficult to argue with. Because the land Dakota people bought for themselves and thrived on was taken away from them. And it all started with a motion by Portage La Prairie City Council in 1911. Council moved to take action against the alleged issues of immorality and drunkenness in the so-called Indian Village, also known as Lot 99, the piece of land the Dakota had purchased for themselves. The Portage Council voted to contact the area's Indian agent and ask that the Dakota people be placed elsewhere. What followed was a more than 60-year series of events which deeply impacted the community of Dakota people who lived around Portage La Prairie. In the ensuing years, the federal government wrested not just Lot 99 from the Dakotas, but also another piece of land known as Lot 14. And by 1973, the Portage area Dakotas had been split in two. One group was placed on land that was originally part of the Long Plain Reserve. This reserve became known as Dakota Plains. And the other group was placed on property known as Parish Lot 25 and became known as Dakota Teepee. Geneva Smoke lives in Dakota Teepee First Nation and Craig Blacksmith is CEO of Dakota Plains. And both of them are dedicated to putting a spotlight on what happened to the Dakotas of Portage La Prairie. Coming up, we'll peer back even further to see just how long Dakota people have been north of the 49th parallel. And also meet Dakota Plains Chief, Orville Smoke, Geneva's grandfather, and hear what he thinks his people are owed. According to some accounts, the story of the Dakota people around Portage La Prairie begins in 1862. That's when a large number of Dakota people fled the so-called Dakota War in Minnesota and made their way north to the Portage La Prairie, Manitoba area. But Chief Orville Smoke of Dakota Plains First Nation says, that's not the whole story. We've always recognized the fact that we were here at time immemorial. There is no Manitoba border. There is no international border. Uh, and uh, we uh, had trade and commerce with our brother and sister tribes in this area. So we've uh, roamed the area forever. And um, because they didn't sign a treaty or didn't take the time to negotiate with the Dakota in this area, and there's a lot of stuff that happened to our people that needs to be recognized. 
we extensively researched it, and we found out that there was actual documentation uh, putting us here pre-Manitoba. And it was authenticated by uh, Hudson Bay Company, um, uh, the French uh, government and, uh, and uh, the English government were uh, saying that the Dakota were in fact in this area at that point in time. Uh, and so somebody telling me that I'm an immigrant is ridiculous. Uh, prove it to me. Uh, I proved otherwise that in fact I was here pre. Ours was uh, a group uh, that went from Portage to different areas bought some private lands in Portage. They um, pooled their money, their wages together and bought a piece of land now known as Lot 99. And they lived uh, on it and they, um, they built houses. Uh, they made streets, they grew gardens, and they were employed. And uh, for some strange reason, in 1911, I think it was April 29, uh, the city of Port La Prairie made a motion to rid uh, the Dakota in the area uh, of uh, their property. Uh, they made a motion and sent it to the Department of Indian Affairs, and Indian Affairs responded very quickly. And uh, thus we ended up here in a semi-remote area. You tell that story about your people buying their own land in this area, thriving, and then the government steps in and it's all taken away. How do you feel about that? Uh, terrible. Uh, we were human beings, no matter what. And when you look back, uh, I did a calculation of the loss of use, and it's in the millions. Uh, and. Uh, if we were given that, the loss of use, we would in fact be independent. And the reason why I can say that, if they left us alone at uh, Lot 99, uh, we would have been independent today because simply we were, we were making a living for ourselves and we lost all of it. What I would like to do is to have them recognize uh, what they've done to us criminally you take away the Indian Act, uh, and I become a human being, and uh, somebody did something terrible to me and my people. Uh, they relocated us from a prime area to an area that's semi-remote, uh, and we're inside another treaty uh, reserve. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but the traffic stops at the bigger reserve. And uh, we tried everything to make uh, ends meet. We, we, we had a store, we had gas bar, we had uh, VLTs and all of it. We just couldn't get uh, the um, population to support it. I sat down and I calculated what would make my people comfortable and what they were done out of. Uh, in order to bring that living standard up to where it was back then, to what it is today, uh, the budget or, that we get today has to be increased to a level where uh, it's a third more than what we are, which comes out to one, one million to one and a half million uh, a year going retroactively to, to uh, 1911. Uh, and uh, to date we are talking. Dakota Plains is preparing to negotiate with Canada. But Craig Blacksmith says the dates set by the government to begin meetings came and went with no word from the feds. And assuming negotiations do get started soon, according to Blacksmith, the question of what Dakota Plains is owed could go beyond the loss of use for Lot 99 Chief Smoke refers to. For Dakota Plains specifically, we go back to that Dominion Lands Act, right? Say we take a figure like 400 people, and uh, according to the Dominion Lands Act, it was per household, per, per person. Under the treaty system or the surrender agreements that the, the Indians signed, the Indians had to give up all the land, the rights to the land, title and privileges. In exchange, the Queen, through her bounty and benevolence, that's what it actually says, 
gives our Indian children 160 acres per family of five. You get 20 square miles of land, which is what Dakota Plains should have had. And uh, you'll see when we go there, it's less than, less than two square miles. So as a starting point, we should have been entitled to 20 square miles, which is 12, 12,000 acres, roughly. And if the going rate is, say, $5,000 an acre, well, you're looking at close to $60 million, starting point. But will they get what they want? Chief Smoke is feeling optimistic. No matter what, somebody somewhere is going to realize that the Dakota were treated unfairly and that uh, we do need uh, to compensate them rather than making contribution dollars. But what of the notion that Dakota people are not indigenous to Canada? This 2009 letter from the Department of Indian Affairs to Sioux Valley Dakota Nation makes the point that the government no longer views the Dakota people as, quote, refugees. But the issue of whether the Dakota people have had a provable pre-contact presence north of the 49th parallel is one that has been leveraged by the federal government in the past. As this 1996 letter from then Minister of Indian Affairs, Ron Irwin, demonstrates. But if the Dakota people had a big yard and then some strangers came along and put the U.S.-Canadian border through it, who's to say whether those Dakota people are Canadian, American, or neither? Yeah, so, and I think in the collections we've got something like 2.8 million artifacts, uh, most of which, if that's institutionally wise, is a part of ours. Kevin Brownlee is a member of Norway House Cree Nation and the curator of archaeology at the Manitoba Museum. He says the Dakota people's traditional territory can be outlined by looking at where their Sandy Lake ceramics show up. Sandy Lake is the term used by archaeologists to describe a certain style of pottery, and it's found throughout sort of uh, northern Minnesota, southern Manitoba, northwestern Ontario, and it's believed to be the ancestral uh, of the Dakota people are, are the people who produce this, uh, this style of pottery. And this one is, it's a little different. It's not a 100% a, uh, Sandy Lake, but it certainly has flavors of that. And so when you start seeing a vessel like this, you know, is this something where the person may have had, you know, part Dakota and part another uh, nation uh, or married into? What does it tell us about where the Dakota people were in North America? It's, you know, sort of heartland where it was sort of defined as that northern Minnesota. Um, and then sort of uh, comes across northwestern Ontario and into Manitoba, a little bit into Saskatchewan. And so really, when you start looking at that plotted against sort of Dakota territory, I mean, it's, it's, it's right there. And, and, you know, I've worked with um, uh, indigenous archaeologists down in Minnesota, down in, um, in northwestern Ontario. And, yeah, you know, the idea that Dakota peoples were making this pottery has sort of become... Um, uh, fairly well accepted within the, the archaeological discipline. I think it, it, it really t uh, showcases the, 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 the idea that, you know, the boundaries that we sort of superimpose uh, on the earth are really sort of meaningless. This pot, for example, was we we're uh, fortunate, a, a graduate student from, uh, who's now at Lakehead University, uh, she studied this as part of her master's degree and was able to take a scraping from the inside of the, the pot, and you can see sort of that, the dark, crusty bits, that sort of burnt on food or food residue. She was able to pull that off and get a date off of this pot. Uh, turned out to be about 1300 CEs, or uh, so uh, about 700 years old. 700 years ago, and where was that found? This one comes from just in the southern part of, uh, uh, just a little bit upstream from uh, um, Pinawa. Uh, yeah, the current town in Pinawa. So somewhere in the Otter Falls area. Well above the 49th parallel. Right, yes, well above, absolutely. So the Dakota people have been here for a while. 
They're not just refugees who fled Minnesota in 1862. We've met Craig Blacksmith at Portage La Prairie's Fort Lorraine Museum. The museum focuses on the pioneer experience in the area, with no mention of the incredible story of the Dakota people who bought Lot 99 with their own hard-earned money. What do you think about the fact that the Dakota story is not currently included in the, uh, the museum here? It's not surprising that there isn't the history of the Dakota people here because the Canadian history books don't teach about the Dakota people. There are very few people that know. The federal government says that recognition of indigenous rights and self-determination discussions are confidential. But Craig Blacksmith is eager to put a spotlight on this hidden history and get down to the business of negotiating compensation. The more the government says, you know, don't do this, well, basically they're the ones lighting a fire under us. It's come to this point, and it shouldn't have never come to this point. All the government has to do is deal with us as human beings. And until that day comes, well, as long as I'm on this earth, and my granddaughters, my family, extended family, <laughs> things have to change in this country. Nothing can replace the years that they took from us. That man who we trusted destroyed my family. It seems like they just want to pay us out to keep us quiet. But we're not going to be quiet. <laughs>